So the question I have for you is, the big question I have for you is, what is the one thing you will do to change the world? So when I ask you that question, it gives two presuppositions. The first is that you think the world needs to be changed. And secondly, that there's something you can do to actually change the world. So I'll ask you the question again. What will you do? What's the one thing you will do to change the world? No doubt, you think about the skills that you have, the talents and abilities. You think about the education you received so far and the education that you will need in the future. But as you think about all those things, you will think about the very fact that there's also something you're very passionate about, something that drives you. So as you think about how you will change the world, you probably think of others who are changing the world, and no doubt, scientists and doctors and nurses who change the world. Engineers, architects, builders change the world. Artists, entertainers, athletes, in some ways they change the world. Military leaders, politicians, government leaders, all these guys and ladies, they change the world. But I want to suggest to you that there may be a different way. What if there was a different way for you to change the world? It's not saying those other ways don't change the world, because they do. But I want to suggest to you that maybe there is a different way and a better way for some of you to change the world. Here's the question. What if the best way for you to change the world is to invest in others who will change the world? I'll repeat it. What if the best way for you to change the world was to invest in others who will change the world? I want to show you an example from the Winter Olympics. The Winter Olympics occur every four years, of course. The Winter Olympics bring together the athletes from all over the world competing in snowboarding and figure skating and ski jumping and all these crazy events. One of the events that happens there is bobsled, and we're going to get to that for a moment. But as a person who's spent some time at the Winter Olympics, I must tell you, you never know who you will meet. You absolutely know who you, never know who you'll meet. There are people from all over the world. Even some very large Canadians might be there when you are there. But our illustration, as I said, is from the world of bobsled. And so I've asked four volunteers to come and help, and we're going to demonstrate something about bobsled right now. Would you give a hand to our four volunteers? Here they come. Here they come. Come quickly, guys. Come quickly, guys. As these guys are coming, I'll tell you a little bit. Bobsledders, they get into a sled, and you can see one of the pictures, and they go 90 miles an hour down an ice chute that's a mile long. All right, so here we go. So we've got uh, four big guys right here. So your name is Ethan, Landon, T Mateo, and... All right, here we go. So, Landon, I think you've been selected. What's your last name? Yes. Okay. Oh, there you go. Yes. Very good. Landon, you're a driver. You're a bobsled driver. If you will stand right here. All right. If you come right here, second, you are the second man on the team. You are right here. You're a push athlete. You guys can imagine. You see the picture? You imagine the bobsled between you. All right. That's where you in a little bit of space. All right. If you'll come right here, you're the third guy in the sled. There you go. And then you are the brakeman. All right. So, the driver push athlete, push athlete, brakeman. These guys have jobs that are pretty obvious. The driver, the brakeman, obviously got to start it. You guys are the strong guys that get this sled going, and then you just hang on for the ride, all right? Now, bobsled is pretty uh, intense. As a matter of fact, um, entertainer Stephen Colbert has been in an F-16 fighter pilot, and he's been in a bobsled. And because of the G-forces of the bobsled, and because there's no seatbelt in a bobsled, he says that the bobsled is a rougher ride. All right, that'll give you an idea. All right, so here's what's going to happen in a real bobsled race. So there's a bar that sticks out at the start, and it's the, to hold on and to push. So go ahead and get your hands on the bar. You've got a bar, you've got a bar, you've got a bar. All right, you don't have a bar. You turn your hands upside down because you grab the sled, and you are the hulk that gets this sled going and, boom, propels it. All right, so you are the strong man in the sled. This guy is the brains of the operation. You guys are, you're the strong man, and you guys are the strength and the strong getting going and the speed. What would happen in a regular bobsled race is this, is you guys are going to, in a moment, you're going to run in place, and then you're going to jump into the sled. You're going to jump in first and sit down. You jump in behind him and put your legs right around him. So he's sitting right there. You're around him, and you're around him. Got it? You got to sit tight, because that bobsled is not very big. All right, when you do that, um, Landon, I'm going to ask you a question. How do you think you're going to drive this bobsled? Just show me with your hands how you're probably going to drive this bobsled. 
Okay, you think it's a steering wheel, right? It's really not. It's, it's bungee cords. It's bungee cords, and you pull it like this. All right, so you're going to pull it. When you pull to the left, the sled's going to go to the left. Pull to the right, the sled's going to go to the right. When he pulls left and right, I want you to lean. And I want all you guys to lean, because if you don't lean, you're going to fall out of the sled, all right? And we do not want to crash going on this sled. And when they lean, if you guys will, out in the audience, if you will go, oh, oh, every time they lean. All right? And I'm going to get you going with a USA cheer as we get going down the sled. All right, so if you guys will come back now, like a football team, they huddle up before they start, so put your hands in here. All right, put your hands in here. Let's get one, two, three. You get, all right, we're going to be USA, all right? One, two, three, USA. USA. All right, get ready. All right, start one. It's clear. The track is clear. All right, run in place, run in place, run in place, run, run in place. And in the sled, in the sled. First man in the sled, second man in the sled, third man in the sled. Get tight, get tight, get tight. Going down the track, going down the track. You're going left or right, dude. Everybody with a chant, if you will, U-S-A, U-S-A. And they're coming up on the last curve, and they're at the finish line. First place gold medal to the USA! Good job. All right. Hey, guys, give me some right here. Here we go. Good job. Nice job. Nice job. Nice job. A big hand for our bobsled team, USA bobsled team. So as you guys can tell, the, uh, every member of the team is very, very important. But uh, the team is made up of a team of people who absolutely support what the driver is doing. The driver is leading the team down the sled, but you've got the push athletes, you've got the brakemen, but you've got other people that help the bobsled team to be great, and those are people that don't show up. Now in the picture you can see some of them, but these are the designers of the bobsled. These are the people who actually build the bobsled. These are the people who are the mechanics that work on a bobsled. And of course, you've got the coaches, the athletic trainers, the strength trainers. That's not even mentioning the fans, the families, the friends, and even those who finance uh, the whole operation. As it were, if Landon were our bobsled driver, um, then we would say if we were part of his team, we are all in the bobsled with him doing our part to help the team be most successful. And that's one example in Olympics. I want to tell you that a little bit, when we were in New York and we were serving there, it's a cold part of the world. I mean, some days it's 35 degrees below zero. Pretty cold. Um, White Face Mountain is there. It's a tremendous mountain. The Olympics were there in 1932 and 1980. And they still have these world-class bobsled and ski jumping and skiing and snowboard events that happen there every single year. Our family lived there. And uh, some of you guys may even know my kids, and they're in that picture. Uh, one of the things that I did while I was living there was led this group, this organization called North Country Ministries. We sought to be a spiritual encouragement uh, to those. So our role was to serve and to be a spiritual encouragement any way that we could. Um, and you'll see more about that later. So the question I have for you, and this is the question that keeps coming by, is that there is one way to change the world that is different than others, so one way to change the world is by investing in others who will change the world. I wasn't a bobsled driver. I didn't build a bobsled. But I helped the bobsled team be the very best that they could be. Let me give you a couple of examples. One, a couple of girls named Alana and Aaron. Alana is from Douglasville, Georgia. Uh, Aaron and Alana, neither one grew up doing bobsled at all. Had not even heard of it until they were actually in college or out of college. But they heard about it, they tried out, the great athletes, and they made the team. They trained, they worked. One of Erin's biggest fears, she was the driver of this team, one of her biggest fears was the, the fear of crashing because of want, not wanting to be injured, but also there have been people in bobsled and skeleton, and, uh, which is one of the other sports, and luge that have literally died on the track. And so she was, I mean, in a very real way, this fear is real. But we worked together. I worked together with these guys. They were part of a Bible study we led. They were part of some of the ministries we did. And I tried to be a spiritual encouragement. We'd pray together. We'd just try to encourage them to be their very best. And let me tell you what happened. They competed in the 2010 Winter Olympics in Canada. They won a bronze medal for the U.S., which was a historic um, uh, year for the uh, U.S. bobsled team. They were part of it. They were interviewed on the Today Show. They were all over media reports and all the different things. They did school assemblies after that. They spoke at corporate events. And you know some of the things they talked about? Overcoming fear, 
persevering during difficult times, teamwork, some of the same, same things that we had talked about. So I felt very humbled, but very proud that when they spoke, some of the things I had invested in them was coming through in what they spoke. As a matter of fact, I want to show you another video. Watch this. Oh, I was eight years old, I started bobsledding. Both mother and father were bobsledders. So looked up to them and uh, really wanted to be with what they were. So it was kind of my destined path in life. I didn't really uh, remember having a choice. This was always it. John Napier is going to work. John is a U.S. Olympic bobsledder, and his work is not like yours. Lake Plaza, New York is different. This is the town where Olympic athletes live and train. And this is the town where Derek Spain lives and trains. Some of the athletes um, live here year round. I love um, just everything about being around athletes. Derek is a North American Mission Board missionary. For him, living in Lake Placid means volunteering at sporting events. We always tell the event organizers, we'll do the jobs that nobody else wants to do. And training in Lake Placid means leading Bible study for the athletes of the Olympic Training Center. For life, eternal life, we have to help them to know the ones who already love Christ, that they're not alone. There are other athletes out there. It was at a Bible study just like this one, where Derek first got to know John Napier. I met John uh, several years ago. His father was dying of cancer. And some of John's teammates told me about it. I uh, went down to the hospital to visit with him. A few weeks after that, I ran into John at the Olympic Training Center. And uh, I just invited him to our Bible study. I had been nice to his family, and so he came back to just sort of do me a favor. And he said the most interesting thing happened. When he went to Bible study, it wasn't boring. It was exciting. He found that it was alive. Last year, John Napier gave his life to Jesus. Now, he never misses small group time at Derek's church. Growing up, I was always uh, living a half-hearted life for a Christian. I saw the joy that Derek had, and I wanted that. I wanted that joy. I wanted God to work in my life. Most days, there are hundreds of John Napiers at the bobsled start back. They are thrill seekers, daredevils. Olympic athletes. Their work is not like yours. But as far as their experience is concerned, their deepest need is the same as anyone. We're praying honestly that among the winter sports athletes in the world, there would be a great awakening. Um, that just, I mean, hundreds or thousands of athletes in these winter sports would come to Christ. So the other athlete I'm telling you about is John Napier. So Alana and Aaron. Uh, were two of the girls, and John competed in those same Olympics. John was part of our ministries in Lake Placid, and then I had the opportunity along with him to be at the Olympics. I was a chaplain. So I didn't get to go to the Olympics as an athlete, but I was there in a spiritual role. And one thing that's really cool about the Interna International Olympic Committee and their uh, charter for the Olympic Games is that at every Olympics, they provide chaplaincy services for uh, folks to practice Judaism, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity, and they provide space for people to, uh, to uh, pray and to practice other religions as well. So I was there as a Christian pastor, as a Christian chaplain. John was there as a bobsled driver. Alana and Aaron were there as bobsled uh, athletes as well. And so we'd spend time together. You may can imagine some of the things we just sit around. Uh, we would watch the other events. Uh, we would play pool. I uh, regularly would get beat by pool by a bobsled driver. Um, but we would spend time together, and we would, in that relaxed environment, just talk about the things, again, that were very important. Because John had come through a lot to get to the Olympics. I mean, he had overcome a lot of adversity, and we had talked about that in our uh, time together before the Olympics and, and even during the Olympics on the days leading to his race. One of the things that we talked about was on the very fact, the very fact that on the day of the opening ceremonies of the 2010 Winter Olympics, a luge athlete had literally died on the track in the training run. There had been a crash, there had been an accident, and he had gotten thrown out of his sled, literally out of the track, and had died, because this track was very dangerous and very steep and very fast. And so John and the other athletes, no doubt, 
we're dealing with that very real fear. So how is he going to overcome it? So we talked about those things. Uh, again, not only did we spend one-on-one time together, but there would be groups of us that spend time together in small groups. We, we would pray. We would encourage one another. We would help. And then when the events would happen, I had the opportunity to be there as a support to the athletes um, at their event with their families. And so here's a picture of me with John and his, uh, his mom, uh, with John's mom and his sister. And we were at the event. And we were there cheering him and his team on. So it's time now, and I'll tell you about the four-man bobsled finals. John had come into the Olympics ranked number four in the world. And if you know anything about the Olympics, they give medals for gold, silver, and bronze, top three. John was number four in the world. He had a very good shot at winning a medal. So we're all encouraging, helping, praying that he will do his very best. In the Olympics, you have four runs down the track. On his first run, he was great, and he was in a good position for a medal. His second run started. His team jumped into the sled. They went halfway down the track, and they crashed. On the video monitors, we could see the sled on its side, sliding, screeching down the sled. We didn't know if they were okay or not. We had seen other people get very hurt. We had seen other people, when they get out of their sleds, and the behavior they had. John's sled finally came to a stop. And all the ENT, all the EMTs and all the uh, track personnel came over there to help all the coaches. I had seen other people when their sleds had crashed. I mean, the whole team got out of the sled mad. I mean, they had let down their country. They had let down themselves. They had let down their team. And they were, I mean, crying and yelling and screaming and throwing stuff. John and his team got out of the sled. And I noticed what John did. I saw it on the big screen. John, first of all, made sure all of his teammates were okay. And then secondly, he looked straight at the camera and he sort of shrugged his shoulders and said, what are you going to do? The poise that he showed, even in adversity, spoke volumes. See, when Alana and Aaron won their bronze medal, it, I mean, raised the spirits of a nation because of their victory. But when John, even in his defeat, when he did that, it spoke volumes. He represented himself well, his country well, and I was very proud to have been behind the scenes helping him to be ready, whether he succeeded with a medal or whether he was defeated with a crash. John went on, and the next day they cheered on their teammates, and some of their teammates won a gold medal. John didn't win. When he was interviewed, he was talking about just the, the things of being glad to be safe and all of these things. And again, I invested in John, and he was able to be in the limelight sharing with others. John went on after the Olympics, and he uh, served in the U.S. military, served in Afghanistan, and uh, he defended our nation. And now he is working on a doctor of chiropractic care. You see him there with our buddy Jesse Beckham, who's uh, doing some other things as well. And so my question to you is this. What if the best way for you to change the world is to invest in others who will change the world. If so, will you? Thank you.